What we're looking at today is a research paper called Reformer, the Efficient Transformer. And what this research paper aims to address is some of the computational restraints that are being put on language models currently. So transformer models are widely implemented nowadays for NLP tasks. And we had a video on BERT, which is one very common model um, that uses transformer architecture. So if you haven't seen that video, check it out. There's a link in the description. And uh, basically these models are growing larger and larger. And also the sequences that we want to apply these to are also growing bigger and bigger. So for example, you might want to input, let's say, an entire text and analyze that text in your model. And if you have the BERT architecture, for example, it has something like 512 inputs uh, as a maximum in terms of characters. And you could easily imagine applications where you need to have significantly longer texts to, to be fed into the network. And that's a big problem. Another problem is that the locations at which you can train these networks is highly limited, right? So currently, you can only train really these models in large um, industrial research labs. So it puts basically, well, it doesn't make for an even playing field, right? If all the research, all the relevant research comes out of, let's say, Google, uh, that's a problem from the perspective of you're not really having um, as many people working on the problems as you could if you had something more efficient. So this is what the reformer aims to address. So it improves memory efficiency, enabling longer sequences to be taken into account in these models. Um, so to give a high level overview of what this paper addresses or tackles, there are namely three points that it addresses. So first of all, uh, we have storing of activations. Normally when you do back propagations of networks, uh, you need to store the activations of, of that network. However, in this model, they use reversible layers, which allows you to not store as much data of the activation functions for your network and therefore improves memory efficiency. Uh, they also do a manipulation of the feed forward layers. Uh, and the reason is that these are normally deep in, well, in, in the networks um, that are being applied and normally cause a significant memory use. But in this paper, what they do is they address these in an alternative way with the form of chunking uh, that saves memory and also improves then uh, the complexity uh, as the sequences grow. Um, an attention mechanism is also altered, and this is really the main point I would say of the paper. So traditionally speaking, uh, every position when you do the attention stage in the transformer needs to look at every other position in basically the input sequence. And this is something that becomes highly, well, where the computational complexity and also memory complexity grows quite significantly. So we can see that they are um, in the order of L2, where L is the, is the length. And in the approximate attention computation that is being used in the reformer model, we can see that we have um, basically a complexity of L log L, which is you know, a significant improvement. So to start this off, we're actually gonna start with this uh, well, local attention scheme. So first we're gonna look at the problem that we're trying to address. So we can see in at the top of this slide here, uh, the classical dot product attention. So this is what's normally used in the transformer models. And the heart of this is a matrix multiplication between queries and keys. Uh, and if these matrices are big, so if our sequences are long, then this is gonna be very computationally demanding. And this is where the, um, well, complexity the squared term in the complexity comes from. Uh, so this is a big problem that we want to address. And basically what we're trying to do when we're doing this is to find the nearest neighbor uh, between queries and keys. So if you, if you imagine or what the attention mechanism does, it looks at one particular word and then it looks at all the other words in the sequence and tries to find similarities between those in terms of semantic meaning. Um, and the value then uh, that we, print out is basically a weighted average of, um, well, the proximity of these attentions between keys, keys and queries. Uh, so we don't necessarily need to look at all of the words in the input sequence if we have some smarter way of doing this, because that's really where the computational complexity comes from. And that's what we're trying to address in the reformer paper. And this is done with something called a, um, a hashing scheme. So where nearby vectors in this space uh, get mapped to a hash bucket, and then we look at attentions inside of those buckets. So we do, let's say, a rough uh, segmentation of all of the keys and, uh, keys and queries that we have, and then just look at the segmented parts to like reduce the amount of uh, computational complexity that would otherwise come along with watching all of them. So 
a high level overview of the computational complexities for these different methods can be seen here. So when we have multi-head attention, uh, if we look at the memory complexity, we have n squared h plus nd. And uh, you know we have the sequence length n, the depth d, and the number of heads h. And the difference then with LSH attention, so um, locally sensitive hashing, is that we have a memory complexity of only nd. So we can see a significant improvement here. Uh, also in the computation, we can see that we reduce the n squared term here to an n log n. So we're going to look now in detail on how this hashing is actually performed. And it's based on something called random rotations. So in order to illustrate this, what they have in the paper is the following figure. So we have two points in, in a vector space. This is only a two-dimensional space for illustration purposes. But when we're talking about keys and queries, which, which this is really meant to represent, uh, we have a significantly higher dimensionality of the space, right? But in order to visualize it, we're going to look at two dimensions. So we have these two vectors. And then in this sort of plane that we have, uh, we divide it according to, to the segments that you can see here. So these represents the different hash buckets. And think, and now what we do is we rotate um, these points that we have some random amount, right? Uh, so you can see three examples here of rotations. The first one ends up here. The second one ends up here. The third one ends up here. So we rotate our points equally. Like we, we don't do different rotations for the different points, but we rotate everything an equal amount. And what will happen is if you have two points, and we do the same then for, for the other example here where the points are close to each other. And what you will notice from these graphs is that when the points are far apart, like in the case here, they generally tend to end up in different buckets. So in the middle rotation here, they end up in the same bucket, but for the other two, it ends up in, in different buckets. But when they're close to each other, we have a significantly higher likelihood of always ending up in the same bucket. So for the example that we have here, they ended up in the same bucket all the time. And that's the general principle. So we know, as we said before, that we want to find keys and queries that are close together, right? And so if we take this approach, probabilistically speaking, we're going to get exactly that. So the buckets here will contain the elements that are close to each other. And then we can for, perform the attention step only on those ones that we already know are close. So then we don't have to consider basically everything. That's the general idea. And looking at this from the perspective of an input sequence, like we have here, we have a representation up top here where we have a sequence of, of queries and keys. And in the transformer models and sort of an assumption that they're making in this paper is that we have equal queries and keys. And in language models, that's a, that's a fair assumption uh, because you basically don't need to differentiate them if you only have a, a decoder in your model. So if those things sound unclear, maybe um, go back and have a look at the, the BERT video for more clarity. But we have these queries and keys, and then we do LSH bucketing. So this is the scheme that we talked about before, where we do the random rotations in a higher dimensional space. So this is just two dimensions again, but you can scale this up to an arbitrary amount of dimensions if you only include these segmentations in, in those dimensions as well. So we do that bucketing, and then these end up in different buckets, which we denote by the colors here. We sort them in terms of different buckets. And what we said then is that we would want to perform basically the attention step on each of these buckets. Now, for computational purposes, it doesn't make a lot of sense uh, for a GPU to look at different lengths of these uh, bucketings. So you can see here that here we have five elements, whereas here we only have three. And that's a problem from, from the perspective of just computational efficiency. So what they do is they split these up in equal batches anyway. So you can see that we don't have basically a distinction purely on um, the number of elements or well, pu purely on the buckets, but rather we have a fixed bucketing, but we order them in accordance with their bucket. So in general, we're going to have buckets containing uh, just one of these colors, but there's going to be some sort of overlap. And the way we then address this or the way the uh, attention scheme works is we look at attentions within the bucket, but we also look at attentions from the previous bucket. So that means that if we have a, a small overlap like this, that's going to be no problem because we're still considering attention in between the two. If we have major overlaps, so let's say this one, the blue one continued all the way over here, then we would basically exclude some information. However, that's not going to be the case generally. It's not. Um, the buckets won't be as uneven in general. Um, but again, this is a probabilistic algorithm. So in specific cases, that might be the case. If we look at basically what this does for our 
complexity now, we see that the standard transformer, so the one used in, in the BERT model, for example, uh, has a computational complexity of big N, um, which is the number of layers, and then N squared D plus ND squared. And in memory efficiency, uh, we basically have the same thing. Whereas for LSH attention transformers, we now are able to improve the computational complexity and the memory complexity to, to these terms here. So you can see a significant improvement. I mean, if you look at the memory, for example, we went from having two squared terms here to basically having um, just linear terms in, in this expression. However, the paper goes even further because they also want to address this n term that we have here. We don't, so this represents the number of layers in our uh, model, and we don't want to have a linear scaling in the number of layers. Optimally, we'd be better if we can just have an ND term in the memory um, complexity. So this is what they try to address by storing the activations, and we're going to go through that in detail now. So as I said, it removes the N term, the big N term, and complexity by allowing activations at any layer to be recovered from activations to the following layer. So the reason why we have this N uh, factor here is because we need to store the activations for backpropagation. And the number of activations we need to store will linearly scale with the amount of layers that we have in our network. Because if you have, well, if you need to store the activations of every layer, if you have twice as many layers, you need to store twice as many activations. So it makes perfect sense that the memory scales in that way. But we want to address that. And we do that by uh, reducible layers. What that means is basically, if you have the activations of one layer, you can use that to calculate what the activations were of a se separate layer. We're going to see how this works now. So in normal residual layers, we have a simple function x to y. So you input x into, uh, into this function and you get your y, right? That's how, we, uh, how these activation functions generally work. And you don't, you know, this is not necessarily reversible. So if you just have y and you don't have full knowledge of f, or even if you have full knowledge of f, it might not be uh, invertible. So you might not be able to get your x back uh, from a y. The difference now in reversible layers is we're able to, to basically backstep. So we can calculate our values forward like we do in, in the forward propagation, but we can also get the attentions back, uh, let's say, after the fact that they've been calculated. And the way we do that is with the following function. So we introduce basically a two-dimensional function here instead. So it's vector valued, and it also takes a vector as input. And we calculate y1, which is just x1 plus f of x2, and y2, which is x2 plus g of y1. And in practice, what these would be is this would be the attention calculation, and this would be the feed forward calculation. But the sort of neat thing about this, right, is regardless of what these functions actually are, if you just look at these two equations that we have, we can solve for x2. So if we start here, you know, if we just put x2 to the other side, we can see that it's y2 minus g of y1. And so long as we have the two outputs, y1 and y2, we can calculate what one of the input values was, namely x2. Once we have this input, we can also calculate x1, because if we just solve for x1 in this equation, we see that it's y1 minus f of x2. And we already calculated x2. So given y1 and y2, we can also backstep to get x1 and x2. And you can do this sequentially, right? So given any layer in the network, so long as you have the activations for one layer, you can backpropagate and get the other ones. So it requires some computation, but what you basically save is memory in the, in the process. So there's no need now to store activations in each layer. And that's going to improve the, um, well, remove the uh, end term that scales with the number of layers that we saw in the previous slide. Um, a last step that they do is also splitting up computation. And that is basically how we calculate the feed forward layers in our model. Uh, so normally, you know, if you have a feed forward layer like this, where you can split it up in your components, uh, you have some computation that you would perform like this. The details of exactly what we do in that computation are not really essential to this, but the key thing to note is that you can calculate these in parallel, and that's usually what you do in order to increase memory efficiency. So you have, uh, let's say, one um, thread calculating this, another one calculating here, and so on. So the computation is parallelized. However, if you chunk this and basically use the th same thread for, for each of these calculations, you again sacrifice uh, computational efficiency, but you um, sort of increase your, your memory efficiency. And in the case of processing large text sequences, the memory efficiency is really key. So that's where the current models uh, tend to fall short. So this is also an enhancement you can make in order to improve that efficiency. 
looking now at uh, basically performance plots. So we concluded now the enhancements that they made to the algorithm and was able to then decrease the computational complexity. Um, in fact, they, they got it down then to memory complexity ND, uh, as we discussed in the beginning with these enhancements. So it's a great improvement in terms of memory complexity, and we now need to evaluate what is basically the performance. Because if you remember, the bucketing scheme that we have is an approximate one. So it's probabilistic, and there's no guarantee that it's going to perform um, on par with basically the full attention mechanism, because we're losing information in that stage. So here's a comparison between those. Um, the performance metric is bits per dimension. We won't go into the details of, of that performance metric, uh, but the lower the value here, basically, the, the better it is. So as a reference, we can see the black line here, which is full attention. So this is sort of our benchmark, and this is what we want to achieve. We also have a number of different hashes here uh, for the test. And you know, the more hashes you have, the closer you would get expect to get in performance to the full attention because essentially a more granular framework. If we only have two hashes, you can see that the performance is lagging behind. It's not as good, um, but it generally converges in a, in a good way. And as we increase the hashes, you can see that we get closer and closer to, to the full attention. And with 16 hashes, there's essentially no difference. I would say that even with eight hashes, there's a quite a minimal difference in, in the example that they train this for. Another neat feature of this training procedure is that you can increase the number of hashes at evaluation time. So you can train it with a lower amount, like lower, uh, well, with fewer hashes, and then increase the number of hashes for evaluation. Because hashes, the more hashes you have, the more computationally com uh, like demanding this is going to be for your machine. So you don't, there's a balance, let's say, or trade-off between computational efficiency and then also performance. And a cool thing that they observed in this paper is that if you train it with a lower number of hashes, you can then increase them at evaluation time and still increase your performance. So it's not that you're stuck to the number of hashes that you train it with, but you can actually further boost the performance by increasing it as you turn to, to evaluation. And here is really the key result, I would say, or well, this is also a key result to indicate that we don't significantly lack performance. So we actually perform equally good as, as the full attention or at least close to, to the same performance. And here is where we uh, really see the model shine. So this relates to computational complexity, specifically the, the right graph here, uh, where we increase the sequence length that we feed into the model. So we can see the dashed line here, which is basically full attention, which grows quadratically with um, the number of, or with the length of, of the input. And for the uh, attention mechanism, or well, for the new model uh, with varying degrees of hashes, we can see that it only grows linearly here. So there is no uh, scaling in the same way, or we don't have the same complexity as we would uh, without, well, in the standard transformer model. And this makes a huge difference when you have bigger sequences as input to, to the model. And that is really the key result that they are demonstrating with this, uh, with this model. Okay, so that's it. And uh, that's what they presented. And that offers a, a great way to take something which is normally very computationally complex and demanding and turn it into something where you can uh, evaluate it on a smaller machine. Also enabling independent researchers to do more um, sophisticated research and also more meaningful research on their own without having as much computational restrictions as they previously did. Okay, so that's it. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.